Hi, this is your host, Sapin Bhartia, and welcome to Tier for Let's Talk. And today we have with us Amre Tenastope, founder and CEO of Binalize. Amre, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Asrobna. It's a pleasure being here. I would love to know a bit about the history and story of the company. Tell me how old is the company, when you folks created it, and what was the problem that you saw was still needed to be solved that led to the creation of this company? So we are almost six years old. Uh, we started in 2018, and the idea was automating a lot of the manual stuff that has been in practice for the last 35, 40 years. Uh, Binalize is a digital forensic sentence and response company. It's now being uh, categorized into cloud investigation and response automation. That's how Gartner calls it, uh, C-I-R-A. So what we basically do is we are automating a lot of the manual stuff uh, that was mainly invented by law enforcement uh, on a machine-by-machine basis and applying digital forensic visibility to a lot of the modern problems that we are facing in security operation centers and mainly MSSP. So what we do is uh, we are automating all that process uh, end-to-end so that you can focus on what matters rather than doing the plumbing work. That's how our customers call it. And who are these customers? You did mention, you know, law enforcement, but I just want to get a kind of pulse of, or idea of, you know, who are you serving? We originally started with the law enforcement uh, in mind, uh, but it quickly changed uh, after the first year. Uh, so the initially, the initial product was a single executable that you run on a machine, collects all the evidence that you need so you can rapidly understand what's happening on that machine. And then we started to get a lot of requests from enterprise customers, uh, which we kept listening uh, in the following five years. And our product turned into uh, a full-blown enterprise product uh, by listening, by like keeping an eye on the customers. And now it's, it's, in a, uh, it's at the center of the security operation center, which means any mid-level to uh, like mid to not SMB, so we are our, our buyers are large enterprises, mid to large enterprises, and also MSSPs who are serving these type of customers. So two types of, types of buyers, enterprises, which can be from any uh, segment, uh, but mainly we have finance, uh, government, um, airlines, uh, banking, uh, finance. Uh, so these are the main buyers. So if I look at the industry that you folks, you know, kind of, operating it uh, if we try to put a label what would that be is it like cyber security is it forensics is it you know maintaining testing is it incident response or you feel that you know what these lines overlap the lines get blurred so uh, to talk about that yeah especially cyber security is like uh, it's quite crowded uh, five years ago, if you asked this question, I would have told you uh, we are a cybersecurity product, but that's not the answer anymore uh, because we don't believe there is 100% cyber security. And that's the reason why the industry is shifting towards cyber resilience. So we're not talking about cyber security anymore. It's cyber resilience. Uh, and Binalize is a cyber resilience uh, company. So we are providing means and platforms for you to investigate, understand, and based on that understanding, you can respond to these type of alerts, which can be false positive elimination, which can be a real case investigation, which can be a proactive or reactive investigation, uh, because we assume that there may be a breach, and uh, that makes us not suitable to the word cyber secure anymore. Talk a bit about uh, your own background, because when you said you started, a company was initially created to cater to the law enforcement. Do you have a background in there? And also, if you can talk about where are you folks based uh, and what kind of you know regional market you folks serve this is is a we are currently operating from 10 countries uh, so it's a, a fairly distributed team and uh, the customers are all around the world uh, we have customers in the us uh, in europe and in uh, like apac so we don't have a specific region but 50 percent of our revenue is coming from the us so we are definitely growing from the uh, us and my background is endpoint security. I spent more than 10 years in reverse engineering malware, uh, working on uh, developing endpoint security solutions that uh, allowed our customers to secure their uh, endpoints. And then uh, it didn't take too much time to understand that whatever we do, there will be a breach because it was a, it was a cat and mouse game 10 years ago. And it's still the case, by the way. And we were finally persuaded that whatever we do, there will be uh, kind of an investigation 
And that's how we started. And the idea of Panelize came while I was involved in high profile investigations with our advisors and they are from law enforcement background. So I'm not from law enforcement. I've been an engineer uh, for more than half of my life. But the idea of the product came uh, while we were investigating these breaches. And it was mainly for solving our own problems, not for creating a commercial product. Uh, but it turned you into being a commercial product uh, uh, pretty fast due to the need. As you're also earlier saying that if I asked the question five years ago, you would say, you know, we are a cybersecurity company, but today the thing is different. I also want to talk a bit about, uh, just forget about the jargon, just forget about the labels and look at the larger picture, the importance of either resiliency, because the we don't live in that data center centric world. We have moved to cloud, we have moved to edge. So the way we look at security is also different. It's not that you're writing a piece of code, shipping it, and someone else is managing it. You are managing it yourself. So talk a bit about how do you look at the overall, I'm trying to put the question properly, developing a code, putting it out and running it by operators team or DevOps team, that's, that, that's good. But you have to maintain the hygiene, the health, the integrity, and also make sure that code is also not susceptible to attacks from outsider or the vulnerability from inside, because we are also leveraging a lot of open source code base these days. And these open source code base comes from different sources. We can talk about supply chain. So security is not that easy. I mean, for you, it is easy, but it's not an easy as simple. So I want to look at it from the holistic perspective, the why companies should have a much more concrete approach towards, uh, once again, we can give them a lot of different names, but how do you look at and the importance? Does that question make sense? Great question. Great question. Actually, it, it summarizes where the industry is shifting towards. Uh, I will step uh, back and not securing the code, but securing the uh, the the employee, securing the human uh, piece uh, should be discussed. That's why uh, the industry is moving towards a mindset of running continuous compromise assessment. So whether you receive an alert or not, whether you uh, face a breach or not, you should always have the mindset of a proactive investigations. So rather than securing the code, uh, what if your employee gets uh, gets Compromised, or what if there is an insider threat? So in this case, uh, there is no external threat, but you have someone inside the company uh, who would help the attackers. So that's why the idea of monitoring uh, and the perception of okay, we'll deploy this product, so it's a timeline, and at some points we'll be having alerts. That's not valid anymore, uh, and this is the reason why it takes 300 days, more than 300 days, based on IBM's latest reports, to identify and contain a breach. Which, which clearly shows the fact that there's something wrong. So that's the reason uh, we have to embrace there should be continuous compromise assessment. So whether I have an alert or not, I should be continuously patrolling the environment mainly. So running a patrol uh, across your enterprise, which can be in the cloud, uh, on-prem, on your mobile. So whatever the assets are comprised in your environment, you should be continuously uh, running an assessment on them. And that's why... Once a dark magic, that's how I call it, uh, compromise assessment was a specialty area for a few companies uh, five, ten years ago. Now it's, uh, it's heading to be more mainstream with the automated tools. So that's how we see it. Uh, the days of monitoring, waiting for an alert is, is way over. When you talk about you know, continuous assessment, uh, I, I almost heard you are talking about continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, and you also mentioned, you know, uh, a lot of other things. Uh, how, how do you see the overlap of some of these practices? You know, of course, CI, CD, we can, it's pipeline, it's tools, it's practices. Uh, the whole, we can talk about observability space. We can talk about site reliability also. So when we look at, you know, what you're talking about protecting uh, users as much as you're protecting your in environments or code base, uh, whose responsibility do you think when you talk to your clients, you work with them, which teams are, do you interact with or you feel that this is, uh, you know, organization-wide problem, but when something becomes everybody's problem, it actually, 
ends up becoming nobody's problem. So, so just just talk about from that perspective once again, if that makes sense. Yeah, let me start with the uh, second part of the question. So, whose responsibility is it? It is. It's the security operation center, NIT problem. Uh, but just because having a lot of uh, platforms that were the responsibility of IT, we, I mean, we saying the industry uh, started to talk about the idea of security operation center which is only responsible for the security aspect of this platform, security view of the enterprise, which makes it clear that this is a SOC uh, responsibility, SOC. And if you are working with an MSSP, then it's the uh, responsibility of MSSP. The first part is similar to what we have in engineering right now, CICD. We didn't have those 10 years ago. At least we didn't uh, as, a, as a team. But now we are enjoying the automation of uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery. So we are focusing on the right problems rather than deploying the code, testing it manually. Uh, like, so these type of problems are not there anymore, thanks to CICD. I see a very similar approach to security operation center, day-to-day uh, -day work. So that's, that's the reason why our customers called before starting with Binalyze. We were doing the plumbing work of security operation center, which means whenever you receive an alert, uh, you need to connect to those machines. You need to ask for permissions. You need to collect evidence. You need to analyze those evidence. And then you end up with a small, very small picture of a potential breach. And then you need to do the same for the other assets, which may be involved, which is very similar to CICD missing in an engineering framework. So you are testing every single piece of code one by one, which makes it... Uh, like impossible to maintain. Uh, so that's that's exactly what's happening in the security industry now. Automating, integrating, so that uh, we can use the creativity of uh, of of human brain uh, on things that matter rather than manual uh, manual stuff that can be automated by the machine. Which is again another uh, aspect of our product. So. You already, you already have CM, SOAR, EDR, XDR, all these security solutions. And what these uh, are doing most of the time are they're generating alerts for your SOC team to take a look at. So why not we are automating the triage piece, uh, automating the investigation piece as much as we can. So rather than asking an investigator to do this, uh, showing the investigator a picture uh, and letting them decide if they should keep going or they should close the case. So that's the aim of a modern talk operation. In the very beginning, you also mentioned that uh, security, when you look at security, is still the kind of cat and mouse game. Security is not a product, it's a process. Uh, as good guys, we have to be right 101% of the time. Bad guys have to be right only once. Um, do you see that just the way now cars have already airbags they have very good you know uh, they have a lot of mechanism you know for slipping skidding you know to kind of avoid things that we know will go wrong from security perspective do you see we are heading with all this automation now we can also talk about ai in a direction where a lot of things are not responses to uh, a lot of things that happen where yeah, it will be extreme where you have to go in and respond, but we should be very proactive where you're saying, hey, you know what, these are not, we are not looking at security from a perspective or something happened and then we are trying to figure out and then we are trying to fix it. What are you seeing which is really happening there? Great point. Uh, like similar to your airbag analogy, uh, I think again, we should take it one step uh, like uh, further and it's similar to having maintenance uh, like control. So, Every car, uh, every year, you need to have, have it checked, right? It's like a checkup for, uh, for, for human. So similar to that analogy, uh, enterprises should be running continuous compromise assessments, whether they have a problem or not, on a continuous basis, rather than uh, depending on their brakes, depending on their, uh, on their car's airbags. So very similar thing is now happening in the enterprise uh, segment which is not uh, there yet, but this is where it should be. And this way, enterprises or any type of company should be running continuous assessments where they are, uh, is there anything wrong rather than waiting for an alert, with, rather than waiting for an accident in, in uh, car terms. So I agree 100%. How much adoption are you seeing of continuous assessment kind of practices? And also, 
would you label it as a practice process or more or less like tools it's a process and practice but it's 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 also a mindset uh, so without having this mindset uh, if you, because we are we are in an industry that has been the way I call it is brainwashed uh, because for the last 35 40 years we are used to buying a product deploying it and then feeling ourselves safe which is what I was doing uh, 10 years ago. We were developing those products. Uh, we were showing you alerts. We were stopping them, uh, preventing them if we can. Uh, but first you should embrace, first we should embrace that this is a mindset shift. And once you acknowledge that uh, that is the, the new way of doing things, then it becomes a process. So it starts with the mindset and then... Uh, followed by a process change in an enterprise. And how much ad adoption are you seeing of uh, this practices, process, culture? It's mostly the immature enterprises who faced that faced a, a, a breach in the past. Uh, so they are the ones who has much higher awareness. Uh, so that's why the adoption is, is like not there yet. Like full adoption is not uh, possible, uh, but it's heading towards. Are you happy with the progress of adoption? What are some of the hurdles, roadblocks, pain points? Is it like awareness? Is it about need for more education? Or it's like, no, they all know it. They just, it's just budget and, and availability of toolings. It's mainly because of the understanding and the awareness level. So uh, the ones, as I mentioned, the ones who are aware of the problem are the ones who were using all, all the, the money can buy. So the best products on the market, but still has an issue. So those are the ones who embrace the new approach much faster. Uh, and I think the biggest hurdle all the industry face, not, not a specific company, including us, is the consolidation of tools uh, and platforms and also the budget uh, constraints. So last year um, on the downturn environment, it was really uh, hard for a lot of startup uh, to uh, get budgets. So the consolidation of the security stack uh, is affecting it. It's, it, it's, a, it's an issue. For our segment, it's not a big issue because we don't uh, have too many competitors. So a handful of uh, products on the market, which is increasing every day. But for the most of the cybersecurity vendors, I think it was the uh, uh, economic downturn was the biggest problem last year. I want to go back to company and technologies. Uh, as you said, the of course, market is getting crowded, but it's not that busy right now. Talk a bit about what does your solution offering look like? Is it a SaaS? Is it software? Is it cloud? What is it? It's actually all of them. Uh, so you can deploy it in your cloud. Uh, you can have it on-prem. Uh, our garment customers are using it in isolated environments. So all those deployment models are possible, which has to be, uh, because the level of visibility you get using uh, a product similar to ours is the utmost visibility. The, way, the reason why we call it is it's the James Webb Telescope of uh, cyber resilience is because of that. Because you get the utmost visibility uh, and then using that level of visibility, you can discover a lot of other uh, stuff that uh, you never thought of uh, before. So the way you use it is, it can be SaaS, it can be on-prem, it can be isolated, uh, all of uh, those deployment models are possible. You also mentioned that there is need for a lot of awareness. Of course, big, big organizations, you know, of course, they have deep pockets and they also try to stay ahead. Uh, smaller organizations, they are the ones, you know, because of some limitations, some, you know, it, 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 it kind of, you know, slows them down. But I want to hear, it's been six years. What role do you see that Binalize is playing in, in kind of changing the whole landscape or future when we look at digital forensics and incident response? Our role is, uh, the way I describe it, is emperor's clothes. Uh, so you know that kid in that emperor's clothes story? Uh, that's how I see ourselves because we are one of the first companies uh, who started to talk about we are not cyber secure anymore. Uh, do not be fooled just because you have cyber security products, you are safe. So I think uh, the role we play is increasing the awareness and the reason why we don't have too many competitors is we have competitors, but uh, they are mostly coming from the law enforcement background. So the products uh, they offer to our customers are mainly uh, developed like 15, uh, sometimes 20 years ago. And uh, just because customers are used to 
having that old mindset, old approach, uh, because they were limited with the with those products, uh, it is hard for them to embrace the new methodology, which is both uh, an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is you are guiding the industry, you are increasing the awareness. At the same time, you are shaping the industry. The disadvantage is uh, it becomes harder. So increasing competition is actually helping us uh, because we are not the only ones defining that this is uh, the way forward. There are other companies who are also uh, telling the same uh, like story to the customers. So our role is uh, we are the kid in that emperor's close story. Talk a bit about uh, the funding you have. Talk about the growth plans you have. Uh, for 2024. So, Binalyze so far raised more than 30 million uh, in uh, three rounds. Uh, we have world class investors. Uh, we started uh, our first funding uh, around three years ago with Early Birds, uh, one of the most prominent species in Europe. And then uh, we onboarded Open Ocean. And in the last round, which happened uh, around two and a half months ago, uh, we onboarded Molten Ventures. Uh, alongside Cisco uh, Ventures, City Ventures, and Deutsche Bank Ventures. So we onboarded two major banks, one from Europe, one from the US, uh, and the global XDR vendor, which shows the maturity of the product uh, and the disruptive nature of the product. So our vision is using what we have right now. This is not even 50% of what uh, we are dreaming. So Binalize in its current state is well ahead of the competition. Uh, but it's, it's just 50% of our dream. Uh, so what we have in our mind is using this visibility as the baseline and building new products uh, which weren't possible before due to the level of um, missing visibility, the lack of visibility, and building a lot of new use cases that will be disrupting the enterprise, uh, enterprise cyber resilience uh, segment. So this is just the beginning. That's that's the reason why we always uh, use that term. This is just the beginning. We have just started. And if I'm not wrong, you folks are you know headquartered in Europe. And when we look at cyber resiliency, uh, Europe, you know, uh, they came up with CRA Cyber Resiliency Act, which is being kind of frowned upon by a lot of open source communities because uh, it puts a lot of uh, onus responsibility on the developers. Uh, what are your thoughts on this and? Uh, uh, what kind of work you're seeing is being done in Europe from uh, the public sector? Because you do, as you said, work closely with law enforcement authorities. Actually, I think Europe is uh, uh, much better to start uh, this kind of uh, uh, initiative is because of the GDPR. Uh, so GDPR emphasizes that uh, the, the, where, where the data should reside. Uh, and that's why I think uh, we are lucky to have it quite strict uh, in this region. And specifically uh, being headquartered in Estonia uh, allows us to uh, have a global mindset because Estonia is, a, I don't know if you have a, like background on it, but it's called the uh, land of unicorns. Uh, it's the highest number of uh, unicorn. Uh, and so it helps us like wrap, uh, speed up the innovation phase of the product uh, without spending our time with the bureaucracy, uh, with the paperwork, because everything is digital here. And combining it with the fact that it's an Estonian, it's a European country, uh, it allows us to do it on a frame that is well defined by uh, the European laws. I think that's an advantage. Amrit, thank you so much for taking time out today. Talk about the company, talk about the whole, uh, how the landscape is changing, how you folks are kind of, I, I look at you as a catalyst in bringing this change. So thanks for sharing all those insights. Uh, but before we uh, close this interview, any, any you know, thoughts you want to leave our audience with? Thanks, that was my pleasure. Uh, I guess I would end it with the favorite quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, from Edmund Lockhart. Uh, he says, every contact leaves a trace. And uh, my question to that, uh, my humble question to that is, how much of that is visible to your enterprise? Uh, I think that's the question we should all answer.